Okay, I, good morning, everyone. I suppose we're live. Uh, I hope everyone can hear me um, on, on the screen. So welcome to everyone. Uh, welcome to today's webinar on the new legal tools and the new legal framework regarding uh, judicial cooperation in France and the United Kingdom post-Brexit. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping everyone can hear me. So if that's not the case, please raise hands or uh, write comments in the, in the Q&A. Um, before we dive into the uh, topics of today, I just wanted to give you all a brief update on what we're doing at the uh, Franco-British Lawyer Society. We are organizing quite a few um, events uh, um, that are coming up soon. Uh, I think I would just like to mention a couple. In uh, mid-April, we are organizing a webinar, um, sort of including senior judges on um, discussing notes and discussing feedback um, about the recent sort of disruption that have that have affected the judicial system. So that's something that's, that that we have never sort of organized before. So we, I would welcome everyone to to join and and listen to uh, to this comparative um, sort of. Uh, sharing of experience. Um, we're then, uh, after that, we're gonna have a uh, two-day symposium on COVID-19. So that's a really wide ranging event in May. Uh, it's going to last for two days. So it will be a uh, sort of two half day uh, event. Again, really, really uh, wide in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, topics. And then we're going to talk about family law and Brexit again, which raises uh, quite a lot of private international law issues. And in June, we are uh, organizing the Maritime Colloquium as well. So it's quite a lot of, quite a lot of events coming up um, at the Society. I'm hoping you can all join. Um, today, I'm particularly happy that um, our two panelists, with whom I will uh, introduce shortly, have accepted to share their experience on judicial cooperation um, both our panelists today will be addressing, uh, as the title says, issues of um, uh, sort of judicial uh, uh, mutual aid and cooperation in various fields. So uh, we'll talk about criminal law, civil law, commercial law, and personally as a, as a uh, commercial disputes lawyer uh, and as someone who doesn't uh, practice criminal law, I'm particularly interested in in that, in that aspect and in understanding the developments uh, of cooperation in the criminal, criminal law field. So I'm really looking forward to that. So um, we're very fortunate to have our uh, two panelists today. These are two key professionals who are deeply involved in uh, judicial cooperation in their respective uh, jurisdictions. So first of all, we have uh, Estelle Co. Estelle Co, as many of our members uh, already know, she's the French liaison judge in, uh, in the United Kingdom here in London. Estelle worked at the Court of Appeal of Saint-Denis de la Réunion, and she's an expert in um, all the instruments of international um, cooperation, mutual assistance in criminal matters. Uh, and that is due to her experience in uh, cross-border jurisdictions. Um, and then uh, our second panelist based in uh, Paris is Holly Gallagher. Holly started her career working on uh, contentious matters as part of the cabinet office of the treasury, of the British government. She specialized in uh, national security, counter-terrorism, and then she worked at the Court of Justice of the European uh, Union. Holly is now, uh, as I said, based in Paris, and she is the liaison judge of the United Kingdom in France. So as you can see, we have um, two, two amazing uh, panelists who are the, the best position to, to address issues of, of uh, judicial cooperation across uh, France and the United Kingdom. And of course, um, I will uh, shortly leave you in the uh, very capable hands of our uh, society president, and of course, I'm talking about uh, Judge Ian Forrester. Uh, I don't think it's easy to introduce Ian, so I won't, but I will be very brief. As many of you know, Ian was up until really recently uh, a judge at the General Court of 
the European Union. Um, as we all know, because of Brexit, uh, his mandate uh, sort of came to an end prematurely. And uh, Ian is the best uh, sort of uh, positioned uh, individual to, to chair the discussion today and to preside over uh, the, the topics today. So Ian, uh, I think it will hand over to you. And uh, just in terms of housekeeping, any questions, please um, include them in the uh, box, in the Q&A box uh, or in the chat box. Uh, we would prefer for questions to uh, be addressed after uh, Estelle and Holly's presentations, but feel, please feel free to write them as they come, and then we will try to address them all uh, at the appropriate time. So, uh, Ian, over to you. Thank you very much. All right. Good morning to everyone. Um, I'm speaking from Luxembourg. Maybe I'm the only person from Luxembourg uh, on this call, but we have them from the north of England, from Scotland, uh, one from Belgium, and a number from, of course, France and, uh, and England. So welcome to you all. And this is a very privileged um, occasion because we have the two individuals specifically challenged with and challenged in the time of Brexit is a, is a genuine word, um, confronted or charged with the responsibility of ensuring smooth cooperation. But having said that, I realized last night that I don't really know what a juge de liaison uh, does. And since we have two rare animals, um, I'd like to begin by asking Holly, tell us, what do you do? Is it difficult? Is it interesting? Um, and do you accept calls and communications from ordinary practicing solicitors in level K. Holly, tell uh, us. Thank you, Ian. Um, I can definitely confirm it's interesting and it also can be very challenging um, as a job. I mean, in essence, the role of um, a liaison judges, Estellas, or a liaison prosecutor such as myself is to facilitate um, judicial cooperation, primarily in criminal matters, in our case between France and the UK. Now what does that mean in practice? Well it can mean if there's an individual in France that the UK wants because um, that individual is suspected of having committed criminal offences in the UK then we would be there to try and facilitate extradition if there's evidence, witnesses, victims in France and I would then be working with the uh, French judges and prosecutors to try and obtain that evidence, to try and get access to the witness. So those are kind of practical examples of the job. But in actual fact, the job is much wider and more strategic because as many of us um, know, and those in the audience are, um, will know as well, we have very different legal systems. So in many respects, Estelle and I are sort of translators, we're converters. And what we aim to do is not only translate and speak each other's languages, but we try and um, ensure that our respective judicial authorities understand the differences in our legal systems and where those differences may create obstacles or pose challenges to doing those things I mentioned, extraditing individuals, securing evidence, etc. then we try to find the way to unblock that. And that's by understanding both our own criminal justice systems, our own legal systems, but also the legal system of our host country. So if you want to think of us as an object, we're sort of like a converter plug. You can't get your um, English plug into a French plug socket. And so Estelle and I are there to be the converter and to try and explain so things happen more easily. And obviously today we're going to speak a little bit about Brexit and the various challenges that that has pre presented. So you'll get a flavour, I think, of that, of, you know, the, the role that we play in trying to unblock those issues. But also you see that we have quite a sort of broader strategic role where we're working with our respective embassies on um, bigger issues where we're trying to perhaps um, do more uh, and work more closely with the French or UK authorities on particular issues. And I can touch on that later on. So that's what we are. We are, we are plug converters. Right. Okay. Estelle, are you insulted or was that an accurate 
Uh, yeah, like, it's completely accurate, and I was also thinking that we are much more than a, a language translator. We are much more than a civil a continental law to common law translator. I would say, from my point of view, um, I have three uh, different tasks. Last, uh, as uh, already said, mainly is uh, judicial cooperation, but also, uh, and for myself, uh, in criminal, civil, and commercial uh, fields. So I'm requested uh, mainly by the French Judicial Authority or the French Ministry of Justice. I don't really answer uh, to law firm or solicitor. Sometimes it happens because a uh, solicitor can contact the French consulate, for example, in Edinburgh or in London, having some question um, in various times if it's in family law or in child matters. So can, I can help. But as you know, I can be judge and parties. So um, I'm not allowed to give any, any legal advice, obviously. So I would just uh, uh, give uh, the general legal framework or the channel. I'll just say that maybe this convention uh, should apply, but I'm not giving any legal advice. But um, also my job uh, is, um, is very special. Uh, I could call it is a um, diplomatic judiciary. So I have the diplomatic status. And it's not only a, um, a practical cooperation. My aim is to also understand what the, what the UK law actually is and um, what we can share. I draft a comparative uh, uh, law approach if time uh, we are intent to have a, um, a le le legislative uh, reform a front who are very keen on uh, to know what happened in UK, what the issue you face is, what is challenging for you, what is the success. So have really to analyze your law. And um, again, in a more a larger uh, wide, I would be very interested uh, about uh, how um, UK deal with law as soft power, diplomatic soft power. We are both part of the permanent five, the Council of Security. So what you view on, on the multilateralism, what you view about human rights, the rule of law, and that's part also of my job. So I just give you an example, but I analyze your integrity review uh, quite a lot, thinking what you're going to do regarding uh, security in national matters, how we can cooperate. Uh, for example, uh, in also criminal field, I'm very interested because you will have uh, um, some interest in Asia uh, area. What could we do? What can we could do together? Uh, and, and also, again, in, in, in not only in criminal, but also on commercial matters, um, how you consider law as an economic field, as an economic area. And that, that's very interesting for the French uh, perspective so so that's that's a lot <laughs> but yes. that's very interesting and i would say i don't think brexit is the, is the end but maybe it's the beginning of something and it's very very challenging for a french leader judge to work to be post uh, in this time of our uh, uh, history our judicial history thanks mm. and uh, do the two of you regularly speak to each other <laughs> Yes, um, so to, to get inside our, maybe our topic, uh, uh, we had uh, many, uh, many talks uh, before the end of the period of transition, but obviously the deal was at the uh, European Commission level. So we didn't have um, uh, really knowledge of what's going on, but our task was to try um, to anticipate uh, which issue would arise, uh, what was our multilateral and um, bilateral convention outside of the EU uh, law and EU tool scope, and uh, also advise her, I think, her uh, boss, uh, uh, Ministry of Justice, do we need to have more convention, in what field, in what area, we, we, we had some, uh, some issue, and after the 1st of January, we had many meetings uh, mainly on criminal topics. So how do we implement this new uh, arrest warrant tool? How will we implement mutual legal assistance? Because I wanted to talk in my presentation, but 
um, the trade, the TC trade or the, 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 the convention, they are just tools, but the, the tools that they have an aim and it's, it's to make a cross border and it's to make judicial cooperation to work. But what makes it work, that's practitioner, that's UK judge, UK lawyer, French judge, friend lawyer. So they need to know about those tools. And now it's just like, uh, we meet each other with those new tools. And that's very important that we can speak, that make sure what our um, interpretation about those tools. So we, we've got many, many meetings to, to talk about and try to, to implement as, as well, as good as we can. Lovely, okay. So um, this association, this society has had many meetings over the past uh, three years uh, on the problems presented uh, by Brexit, the problems which needed to be addressed and not all of those have been addressed by our political leaders. But we had, for example, the Lord Advocate, uh, James Wolfe, talking about uh, criminal cooperation. We've had a number of national experts uh, talking about um, the problems which they hoped would be resolved uh, during the um, negotiation phase. Many of these problems, sadly, have not been resolved. Uh, so, for example, there's, um, well, police cooperation is one thing, uh, technical regulations on hundreds, thousands of items, that's another thing, um, and uh, cooperation uh, cooperation isn't quite the word, uh, the whole regime governing private international law and the conventions on contracts, on um, um, contractual disputes, on the proper law, on um, matrimonial matters and so on. Uh, so those subjects have been discussed. Now we're going to hear today First of all, Estelle Crow describing with some slides her priorities, and then Holly Gallagher will be giving uh, the UK point of view, um, and then we'll have uh, some questions. So if you, as uh, Leonardo said, if you've got questions you don't understand, please use either the chat function or the Q&A function, depending on your screen and your version of Zoom. And uh, at the end, say less than an hour from now, I hope that we will have answered at least 50% of your uncertainties. So, um, first of all, Estelle Co, you are most welcome. We're really grateful that you're here with us. Yeah, uh, by the time, I just want to thank, and uh, again, I just want to mention that I'm not speaking on the French embassy or the uh, French Ministry of Justice, but it's just my, uh, I'm speaking as a, so my, my, my current job and practitioner as French liaison judge. So it's really a challenge to present the Brexit impact and civil commercial criminal field in a short presentation. I should remind this discussion between Mao and Henry Kissinger. What do you think about the consequence of the French Revolution? Well, it's too early <laughs> to know yet. So obviously three months um, after uh, the end of the period of transition is, is a very small uh, period of time, but, but I, try to, uh, I try to limit my time to 20 minutes as well, because it's supposed to be the length of cognitive capacity to listen. So I hope not to be um, boring, um, but not that simple to answer. Does EU law still apply? So we know that uh, the end of the transition period uh, ended uh, the 31 of December 2020, but does it mean that uh, uh, by now uh, EU UK judiciary and French judiciary uh, won't apply any EU law or a, any EU tools? Um, that, that, that's a prejudice because um, we got uh, at the time two parallel system and EU law will remain in force in many cases. For example, in institute cases or when agreement or triggering factor 
occur before um, the 1st of January 2021. It may be that simple, but I don't think it would be so simple. I think it would be for the legal practitioner to do casuistic work, because for uh, each, each time, for each case, uh, we will have uh, um, to interpret and to know what does it mean to be an institute cases, what really is the triggering factor. So I think new developments uh, will come up as cases uh, will come up as well. So uh, I would say that in many cases, the EU law remains in force and will in certain circumstances for a very period of time. So it's not a question of months if we, if we regard some breach of contract who have been agreed before the end of transition, for example. And I think that was something uh, to be need to be, to be flagged uh, uh, because it's, it's, it's quite important. So, uh, uh, our new uh, legal framework, so uh, the Trade and Commission Agreement, the TCA, set up uh, new tools, set up shortcomings and transitional provisions. It's very important to, to have in mind that the, the, co the criminal cooperation, so both law enforcement and uh, criminal judicial cooperation, uh, are part of the TCA. But the civil and the commercial mutual aid are not part of the TCA. Uh, that wasn't in the, the scope of the task force uh, to negotiate the deal. So regarding civil and commercial mutual aids, they are not in the deal. And we'll see later, they are most based on bilateral and multilateral uh, convention, mainly the egg uh, convention. So first of all, I wanted to, to talk to you um, about um, the um, um, judicial cooperation and crimi in criminal matters. So what was uh, as at stake? I think during the negotiation, uh, all agree about the need to exchange uh, intelligence, to exchange evidence, the need to maintain a high level of cooperation and to maintain our main capabilities. So if we we'll have a look at the TCA regarding law enforcement and uh, judicial cooperation, the general provision um, uh, is the objective, uh, in, objective is in relation to the prevention, the investigation, detection, prosecution of criminal offense. It's also to prevent and fight against money laundering and financing of terrorism. So clearly, uh, the aim was to get efficiency of cooperation to tackle organization crime, terrorism, with a broad, comprehensive and balanced security for a mutual benefit. In that matter, we've got some tools and the, this new uh, arrest warrant is one of a uh, very uh, interesting one because it's not a uh, EU tool, but it's not also a tool that we usually use with, a, as we call, a third state country. Uh, is a tool which is very close uh, to the former European arrest uh, warrants. And it showed that um, we won't cooperate uh, with UK like we would cooperate with United States or with India. And clearly, uh, the United Kingdom has been considered as a privileged third country. We've got privileged uh, relationship based on common understanding of fundamental rights um, for now. So I would say that uh, within the, the TCA, uh, the mutual trust still exists. So for the extradition system, um, uh, the deal, we opt for um, a fully judicial mechanism. So we have no political interference, no political decision, uh, which is usually the, the case uh, regarding extradition with, with third countries. Uh, maybe the main difference from uh, France's uh, point of view is that we will not extradite our national and we will not extradite also for a political offense. But again, I think the tool is very efficient and very close that uh, the European arrest uh, warrants. 
Regarding uh, mutual legal assistance in uh, criminal matters, um, the Legal Basis Convention is based on the European Convention on Criminal Matters and its two additional protocols uh, from 1969. But the TCA is clearly a framework uh, which, which clarify, which simplify the application of the existing agreements. So when we talk about the TCA on that matters, uh, what does it bring uh, to the table? I would say that TCA guarantee uh, recognition and execution uh, of requests in a determined short time frame, for example, uh, 45 days within the, the reception of the request for the recognition and uh, 90 days. Days for the again because our mutual trusts are quite strong. Uh, we've got a channel transmission from the uh, French judicial authority, so you won't have uh, any political interference uh, when French judiciary would send directly to UK mutual legal assistance. From the uh, UK part, you, you still have central authority, so the UKCA for England and Wales. You've got one central authority for Scotland and another one for, for Northern Ireland. Again, uh, the tools is still ongoing, is still implementing, because a committee uh, is actually um, set up to design a mutual legal assistance standard form, and I think Oli and I are uh, really looking forward uh, to, to know and to implement the, this new standard form. So once again, uh, we were very close to the former EU tools and this Council of Europe Convention from 1969 offers the possibility of a very large uh, uh, main uh, um, capability um, to, to obtain um, cooperation in criminal um, mutual assistance. Um, I, I want to talk very uh, shortly about uh, Eurojust. So um, UK uh, got a third country status since the 1st of January 2021. But once again, uh, I think uh, uh, our relationship with UK is, is close because the UK can have a, a liaison a prosecutor post and based in uh, Eurojust. And again, uh, it's also possible to to draft a joint investigation team in, uh, with Eurojust. So we maintain a very close uh, relationship with UK at Eurojust uh, level. Another, um, another field is the exchange of criminal records. So the UK is no longer part of the European, European Criminal Records Information, so-called the uh, ECRIS. So by, uh, by now, our legal basis are still the 1969 the European Convention, but also the, the TCA. Um, I would say from my point of view that uh, uh, before the Brexit, the exchange of criminal records uh, wasn't fully straightforward. Uh, many convictions were not sent to a crease or a very long time delivery. So uh, I think this new legal framework uh, is not really a massive loss uh, from the front perspective as, as a, if we compare with what we had um, before. So you would maybe ask, but what is no uh, longer applicable? Uh, so in criminal matters, uh, uh, mainly every, um, every post-sentencing measures are not possible, so we could have any more supervision of probation measures, of alternative sanction. We still have transfer of sentence person, but it's less, it's less easy than it was to because it's based on the Council of Europe conventions. So it's, it's, there is not a very, it's not very satisfied but there's not a very satisfaction on this matter, but um, what else? We won't have any European protection order. Uh, we won't take into account uh, convention in other member states. And uh, for the police to police cooperation, very important. The UK won't have uh, any more access to the Schengen information uh, system. 
Um, and mainly, this is a big point, but it's also uh, for criminal, civil and commercial. As you know, the European Court of Justice um, is no more competent. We won't have any uh, supranational courts. So, if, uh, so by now, if uh, disputes arise, then uh, I would be specific dispute resolution mechanism. But uh, this mechanism is purely a political one. So in case uh, we've got a breach of agreement, then the TCA can be suspended or terminated uh, at will. But as I, as mentioned earlier, I really think that TCA um, and our convention, they are, they are tools and they are, yes, they are legal tools, but they are political tools. And the success of uh, um, cooperation depends not only on the efficiency of the tools we can use, but I really think that it depends on the goodwill to practitioners to implement it. So um, it would be very important as practitioner, as lawyers, as solicitor, barrister, judges, uh, prosecutor from uh, France and from the UK uh, to make it a success uh, by, I hope, uh, having goodwill by implementing and interpreting our agreements and our uh, convention, international convention. So now I want to talk briefly uh, about the, a new uh, framework for civil and commercial uh, mutual assistance. So, so I may repeat, but that was not part uh, of the deal, that's not part of the TCA. So regarding our relationship, we've got um, an old convention uh, from 1922, a bilateral one, uh, which is not very relevant because uh, she's, it's an old convention. The channel of transmission uh, mainly is diplomatic channel. So I don't think UK and France uh, will, usually, will, will use uh, uh, this convention um, often. So now our relationship uh, is based on multilateral convention, mainly uh, the different uh, egg uh, conventions. So I can mention the one on 1965 um, for the notification of judicial and extrajudicial documents or the egg convention, the 1960 uh, regarding, obtain, regarding the evidence to obtain evidence uh, abroad. Those tools are already known by the practitioner, the French one and the UK one, uh, because they use it uh, out, outside of the, the EU uh, field and EU era. So just now they have to adapt uh, their knowledge of their, 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 this convention in the new cross-border issue between, between France and EU, EU, uh, EU states and, and the UK. So to go further uh, for measures in civil and commercial uh, matters, so the provision of the so-called Bruxelles 1 and Bruxelles 2 uh, regulation will no longer uh, apply by now. Um, and uh, so what, what, how we, what, what, what will apply, sorry, uh, from the French perspective, we will use the French private international law uh, to determine whether the French court has a jur jurisdiction. Um, and so there, there, I think there will be some challenges because from the, the France uh, point of view, um, in many times it will be uh, the first court size uh, interpretation uh, versus maybe the UK point of view, which would be more the best placed court. So the, new, the, the two main challenges in civil and commercial matters would be uh, the court forum shopping in, in one part and the applicable law in other parts. So again, um, regarding the applicable Rome 1 and Rome 2 do not apply anymore. So regarding uh, contract and agreement, but those two were um, set up universal applicable law 
So the applicable law designated uh, by Rome 1 and 2 regulation uh, still apply, even if uh, it's not a member state law. That means, well, that's my point of view, that, that will be not a big issue for uh, uh, UK that's a part of it, uh, because it, it won't change uh, the applicable law. The big challenge is regarding uh, uh, Lugano and the UK accession to and to, to the Lugano uh, Convention, uh, because the Lugano uh, Convention um, 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 implements recognition and execution of decision, and uh, this is a key uh, uh, feature. So if UK doesn't join the Lugano and, and for now, it would be executive process uh, to have this recognition uh, or is it the, the European uh, member states. So I really think Lugano is a pivotal aspect of future commercial trade between uh, UK and the rest of uh, Europe. So um, uh, I think the, the negotiation are still ongoing. Uh, it's um, European Commission uh, jurisdiction. Uh, so at that stage. So again, I think it's very important uh, for UK to know if they can join uh, Lugano Convention uh, or not. And uh, also, um, I would say uh, uh, that uh, regarding civil and commercial um, cooperation, the UK, the UK didn't join yet the Hague Convention 2019, uh, which is also apply for recognition and enforcement of um, civil decision and uh, commercial matters. A few words uh, about family uh, matters and family cooperation. That's a, that's quite a big uh, part of our activity here uh, in in London. We've got uh, um, quite a lot of requests from French jurisdiction or UK jurisdiction. So now um, again, uh, we will uh, cooperate uh, within uh, the Hague Convention. Uh, mainly uh, the 1965 and the 1966 uh, Egg Convention regarding matrimonial matters, parental responsibility, maintenance obligation, and illicit movement of uh, children. Um, obviously, there are a few changes, but, but not that much, uh, because regarding the Egg Convention, this, this uh, principle of mutual recognition of the decision, so uh, UK decision can be enforced uh, without executive process in France. So I think I, I think it's it's a good point, but the main problem is regarding uh, maintenance uh, obligation and uh, support obligation because we have no uh, international tools uh, for a mutual recognition on this on this base, and even if UK join the 2019 Hague uh, Convention, maintenance obligation and support obligation are excluded uh, from this, uh, this convention. So, so, so that's still a, a big issue between uh, our two countries. Um, I'm going very fast, but um, regarding Brexit and insolvency, uh, we've got no bilateral convention. So we've got big impact uh, because of the Brexit and France and UK uh, will apply their uh, national law. Uh, for France, it's mainly um, case law. And we also had to deal with the recognition of professional quali qualification for insolvency practitioner. So uh, normally qualification should have been sent to France before the end of the period of transition for um, recognition. Um, if we talk very briefly about Brexit and uh, economic law, uh, again, we've got an impact on proceedings relating uh, to intellectual property rights and especially proceeding uh, relating to uh, European patents and also concerning uh, European brands. So uh, it's, it's not, it's just out of my field. So I, I just want to mention it, but I won't go uh, further on, on these uh, matters. Um, another field is the Brexit and the legal profession. 
Uh, I think I could say right now that rules are pretty much uh, uh, laid down. Uh, we have different situation if we if we talk about individual practice or if we uh, uh, regard LLP. So I think in my perspective that was a seamless transition uh, from the LLP. Uh, many LLP um, has been registered in France between uh, before the the end of the transition period. And regarding the individuals. Um, it depends if you want to be registered uh, with a French bar or if you want to apply for recognition of your professional uh, qualification. Again, uh, that was also part of the TCA um, agreement and the French, uh, we've got a decret, art article uh, 100 of the decret, uh, uh, 27 November 1991, and we provide a special process for lawyer coming uh, from outside the EU. But as far as I know, uh, the UK lawyer, lawyer were very well prepared. They, they knew uh, the, the rules and we, ha we had some, uh, some uh, recognition process before uh, the period of the end of the period of, uh, of transition. So I would finish uh, my presentations to say uh, now we have to shape our future. And uh, obviously um, uh, the French and the UK judiciary will have a central role in applying and interpreting the TCA and also the international, international convention I just talked about. Uh, I really think uh, the role of the legal uh, practitioner is a key, is a key role also uh, when they're drafting their conclusion for the, for the judiciary, how they interpret and, and how they will be, they will be creative um, for the judiciary in interpreting uh, this new uh, legal framework. A uh, big question uh, from myself and the France uh, point of view, uh, what about uh, the European Court of Justice case law in the UK uh, law? Uh, um, will it be um, still a binding precedent and how the uh, UK uh, judiciary will deal with this former uh, European, uh, uh, European uh, decision? And to conclude uh, my presentation, I would like to remind uh, Lord Denning, Denning words. Uh, he said in 1974, when we come to matters with an European element, the treaty is like an incoming tide. It flows into the estuaries and up the rivers. I will add today that the water dwindle but the nature is creative. So do the lawyers to make sure all sorts of law, including the TCA and the multilateral convention can feed the needs for our European justice. Thank you for uh, your attention. Thank you very much. Thanks, that was a very comprehensive, incredibly interesting. Um, my presentation will touch on a little bit more of the detail in terms of um, judicial cooperation in criminal matters. And I'll, um, I'll try not to go into quite as much detail in some areas so that we've got enough time for questions at the end. Now, you'll probably remember from the many, many debates that followed uh, the UK's decision to leave the EU, that security was a central concern. Um, over the 40 years of the UK's membership, and as many uh, as more countries acceded to the EU, we saw closer cooperation within the EU in relation to security. And that's primarily because um, one of the huge benefits of uh, the European Union that we have in non-pandemic times is the ability to move freely and travel within the EU. But that also poses a huge benefit, unfortunately, to criminals. And over the years, um, we have seen the increasing international nature of crime, both in terms of serious organised crime, which may be um, drug or arms trafficking, but also um, human trafficking, uh, paedophile rings, uh, um, child sexual offences and all member states recognised the need to work closely together to combat um, serious criminality that affected all of our citizens. 
So there was a big question when the UK took the decision to uh, leave the EU as to how we would continue to ensure our um, citizens' safety and security and bring criminals to justice. Now, on the one hand, you may have thought, well, it was a bit of a no brainer. Of course, we'd want to uh, find a way to work closely together. But as you know, um, Brexit is a political um, issue and politics did still play a part in those discussions surrounding security. Um, particularly given that the UK had some um, quite clear red lines in terms of its future relationship with the European Union. Now I should say, just as a disclaimer as Estelle has done, I'm speaking in a, in a personal capacity not um, on behalf of um, the UK government or the British Embassy in Paris, so all views are my own, but I'll, I'll try not to give too many value judgments in relation to this. So as I say, security was a big concern and it was particularly a concern for UK and EU law enforcement and judicial authorities. Um, we'd seen years of closer cooperation and the real value in the tools that had been agreed between member states to try and tackle uh, serious organised crime in particular in the EU. And there was a real concern that the loss of those tools would make citizens less safe. So in some respects, after many years of discussions, there was a bit of a sigh of relief in October 2019 when the political declaration agreed between the UK and the EU made a specific and explicit reference to security and the need to work closely together in that area, um, citing in particular um, geographic proximity, as I said, um, criminality um, is felt internationally, we do need to tackle it um, as an international community, and the fact that um, there are sort of shared threats, so um, drugs that may come into southern Spain often make their way up through the north of Europe into the UK, and the effects of that criminality are felt by UK citizens. So the political declaration really focused on um, four key areas where security cooperation should continue. That was data exchange. Um, specifically, we're talking about um, criminal convictions, uh, the sharing of um, DNA or fingerprint evidence, and I'll come on to that um, a little bit later. Extradition and mutual legal assistance. Uh, the UK's participation in agencies, which Estelle's already referred to, uh, Eurojust and Europol, which are really important bodies for close working um, in the, that field. And then anti-money laundering and counter-terrorism uh, financing. Now, um, it was a rocky road, you'll all remember, um, from uh, June 2016 onwards, when we weren't sure what the new shape of the UK's relationship with the EU would be. And there were a number of occasions when there was a real concern that the UK was simply going to fall out of the EU and we were going to lose um, access to those various um, security and judicial cooperation tools from one day to the next. And that meant on a practical basis, a lot of um, panicked preparatory work at various different points over those years so that we were ready both um, in the UK and in France, but also in the other EU member states in the event that the UK did fall out to make sure that that didn't mean, for example, criminals that were um, pending extradition hearings weren't immediately released or we didn't lose evidence or we didn't lose access to some of those vital databases. And that's why when the withdrawal agreement was agreed at the end of uh, 2019, there was also a bit of a sigh of relief because Article 62 includes some specific provisions as to how we will deal with legacy cases. And that's been a really important part of a smoother transition as we reached the end of the transition period last year and entered into the new legal landscape at the beginning of this year. Now, interestingly, in February 2020, the UK government published its approach to the um, uh, UK-EU negotiations. And I put there the 10 capabilities that the UK was looking um, to maintain access to or to maintain. Um, now, that's interesting because you'll see it goes 
beyond what was agreed in the political declaration. And we all know now that some of those capabilities that the UK was um, looking to ret uh, retain, and probably most importantly, access to CIS2, um, it, it wasn't possible. Um, that wasn't part of the negotiated deal in the end. And I think CIS2 is probably um, the capability that has attracted um, the most media attention in terms of what that means for um, EU and UK citizen security going forward and how police can effectively um, fight crime without access to that quite vital uh, database. Now I mentioned earlier that security um, was thought to have been a bit of a no-brainer but that some aspects of the UK's negotiating uh, position made it difficult and probably one of the the key points I was trying to make was the UK's red line that there would be no jurisdiction for the Court of Justice of the European Union. And um, you'll probably remember that after the referendum, the CJEU became a bit of a bet noir for the UK government. There was a lot of focus on it. And uh, both Theresa May's government and Johnson's government were very clear that the um, CJEU should have no role in the oversight of the future agreement. Um, obviously, that's not without its difficulties, but what we've ended up with is a new dispute resolution mechanism, which I'll touch on briefly at the end. So after lots of um, tense and sometimes stressful negotiations, we did have uh, agreement of the Trade and Cooperation Agreement. Um, at the end of last year, I think it was on Christmas Eve that it was announced, much to many people's sigh of relief that we weren't just going to drop out. Um, in terms of security cooperation, there are really sort of three pillars to touch upon. Data exchange, really very a very important part of law enforcement and judicial cooperation these days. We're talking about making sure that each other are aware of um, the potential of criminals on the soil, be that because they have criminal records or because um, DNA or fingerprint uh, have been um, identified at a crime scene and the very important passenger name record and that's data attained by airlines. Then we've got practical cooperation, extradition, mutual legal assistance and then cooperation in the EU agencies. So broadly speaking, this has been seen as um, a, a successful agreement. It's probably the closest agreement that the EU has with a third country, a non-EU member state, but it probably is worth um, being frank that we have lost some capabilities and that in some areas we are in a less good position than we were as an EU member state. Now, um, one important thing to note, um, particularly given, as I've said, this is one of the closest um, security partnerships that the EU has with a third country, is the commitment at the outset, and that's included in the general provisions and specific provisions of the TCA, um, to fundamental rights. And you'll note that there are articles in the TCA which allow for both um, the suspension but also the termination of some of the security and judicial cooperation provisions in the event of any um, regression vis-a-vis -vis, um, the application of uh, fundamental rights and the rule of law. Now that's overseen by this dispute um, resolution mechanism, the Specialised Committee on Law Enforcement and Judicial Cooperation, but um, really that um, commitment and as Estelle said the history of the UK and also uh, member states to fundamental rights and the um, rule of law have allowed us to have this very close um, agreement and relationship in respect of um, justice and security. So um, in terms of uh, the exchange of uh, criminal records, um, just a brief point which Estelle has already made, there was a lot of concern about um, security and what our future relationship would be in the event that we weren't able to agree uh, a deal between the UK and the EU. Now, as one French official very eloquently put it to me, we weren't going to find ourselves in a legal no man's land because what the fallback would be for judicial cooperation in criminal matters were numerous Council of Europe conventions dealing with extradition, mutual legal assistance, um, asset um, 
um, recovery, so restraint and confiscation. But most of those conventions are really quite old. They, they date from the late 50s. And um, we do have some experience of uh, dealing with them as practitioners, and we know they can be really quite slow and clunky, often requiring diplomatic channels to be used rather than direct transmission between judicial authorities, which can massively slow things down. So in some areas, you will see that the TCA tops up those Council of Europe conventions. In other areas there are standalone provisions, but the exchange of criminal records is one area where we sort of have a top up. So we've got the um, uh, 1959 Council of Europe convention on mutual assistance in criminal matters. And um, those provisions apply for the exchange of criminal records, but we've got some top ups in the TCA and some really quite important top ups, including a more streamlined process. So we're still using the sort of um, technical infrastructure of ECRIS. It's just the UK's moved out of that and got its own. And we've got time limited periods for the exchange of um, information. Now, Estelle has given the um, French perspective in terms of um, perhaps perceptions of how well that works. Um, and of course, all of these things can be improved, but um, criminal records exchanges is certainly a very important part of um, law enforcement and judicial cooperation. As I say, um, for example, we'll have cases where an individual may have committed quite serious sexual offences against children in the UK, returned to France. There is an obligation to make sure that the French authorities are aware of that so they can take um, measures to ensure that their citizens are protected, that their law enforcement authorities are aware of that conviction in the UK. So that's what the exchange of criminal records is all about. Now, um, it's worth saying before I move on to Prune, which is the exchange of DNA and fingerprints, um, data exchange was always going to be a slightly tricky area because the, e, uh, the UK was leaving the EU and all of the uh, agreed provisions in relation to data protection, specifically the GDPR. Now, um, the UK has um, benefited from what's known as the bridge for a period of essentially six months into, uh, until July, where whilst the Commission is making a data adequacy decision in respect of the UK, um, there is um, provision within the TCA that the UK will be continued to be treated as though it were a part of the European economic area, so data conti can continue to move freely. And you may have seen that in mid-February of this year, the Commission published its draft decisions in respect, to, in respect of the UK's adequacy under the GDPR and Law Enforcement Directive. And at the moment, the Commission's view is that the UK is adequate. However, those decisions must now be considered by the European Data Protection Board. And there will need to be in place the Commission's adequacy decision by the end of June in order for this data exchange to continue and you know that is a sort of overhanging concern. Now I'm, I'm conscious of time so I'm just going to zip through the rest of this so exchange of DNA fingerprints and vehicle registration data speaks for itself that's included in title 2 of part 3 of the TCA um, worth pointing out that um, some of you may remember um, the UK's um, opt-out decisions. Now, Prune fell under um, our deliberations over which um, justice and security tools we were going to opt out of as an EU member state. We decided to join Prune, but it's actually only very recently been operational in the UK uh, since July 2019, so post the decision to leave the EU, that law enforcement authorities have already seen massive benefits to this um, in terms of uh, tackling serious organised crime. So it was quite important to uh, the UK government to try and maintain access to Prune, which it's been able to do. Um, However, not all of it's in place. So at the moment, we in the UK are dealing with DNA and fingerprint exchanges and vehicle registration data is to come into force in the future. And the TCA provides for that. And then uh, passenger name records, again, a really in important law enforcement tools. This is essentially um, data 
held by airlines that can enable law enforcement um, authorities to track travel, um, identify associates of serious criminals or um, even terrorists. And again, really important part of uh, the UK's negotiating mandate to try and um, ensure that uh, the exchange of this data could continue. Now, it's not unprecedented to have a PNR um, data exchange agreement with a third country, as many of you will know, but those have not been without issues. Um, you will know that um, any of those of you who follow the jurisprudence of the CJEU, and in actual fact, um, I think the Commissioner said um, this agreement with the UK was one of the first times where um, they were able to, the Commission, agree um, a PNR agreement with a third country taking into account the jurisprudence of the um, CJEU and some of the issues. So you'll note that um, the title in the TCA dealing with PNR data has quite specific provisions in terms of the data protection safeguards that have to be in place. So that's data exchange. Um, then quickly, um, extradition. Um, in the TCA referred to as surrender. As Estelle said, very um, similar to what we saw in the European arrest warrant regime. And the provisions of the TCA are very much based upon um, the Norway, Iceland, EU um, surrender agreement. So at first blush, we may think We've really maintained exactly what we had previously, but there are some fundamental differences. Estelle touched upon some of them, but um, some of those differences um, are particularly concerning for the UK. So we've still got a standardised template. We've still got um, a form that is used as the arrest warrant, and it looks very much like the European arrest warrant form. We've still maintained direct transmission between central authorities, so we don't have to use those sort of cumbersome diplomatic routes that we would have done if we were reliant on the Council of Europe conventions. And we have time limits in place. Really important, not just for the EU and the UK to ensure effective justice, but actually for the individuals who are arrested on a European arrest warrant to ensure that they have um, you know, swift justice themselves. Now, you'll also know if you've read the TCA in detail, which I forgive you if you haven't done because it's a very long document, um, a list of offences very similar to the ones, again, um, contained in the um, European Arrest Warrant Framework decision. And there's a provision there that enables, um, on the basis of reciprocity, um, the UK and EU member states to waive the requirement for dual criminality in respect of those offences, like the EAW, just tick the offence and say, yes, here is a drug tra trafficking offence, and we all recognise that drug trafficking is an offence in all of our countries. However, the UK has not made a declaration in respect of dual criminality, which means that in each individual case, dual criminality will need to be established. That's one of the key differences. Another difference, which Estella's touched upon, is um, the TCA enables member states to invoke nationality bars and there are quite a significant number of member states that do have nationality bars, France being one of them. And that's where I say that is a potential issue for the UK because that means where we may want to extradite a French national to the UK in respect of serious offences, we would no longer be able to do so. And now what we'd have to look to do with France and is provided for in the TCA is transfer our proceedings to the French authorities in the hope that they would prosecute that individual or investigate that individual on our behalf. But that is not without its difficulties also, um, which I would have gone into detail with, but I'm really conscious of time. And then just a quick interesting um, point in terms of differences, there's now an explicit reference to a proportionality control in the TCA. Um, those of you who are more familiar with the UK criminal justice system will know that uh, the UK incorporated the EAW framework decision in its Extradition Act. Um, and the Extradition Act in some respects, gold-plated the framework decision, uh, act, um, uh, incorporating additional controls, one of which was proportionality, much to um, the aggravation of some EU member states, given that that went beyond what was agreed in the framework decision. So we now have an explicit proportionality control in the TCA, 
all member states have signed up for it. And this essentially requires the executing authority to take into account the rights of the requested person, the interests of the victim, the seriousness of the conduct. And that's in the hope to avoid some of the wrangles that you may be aware of where it was felt that European arrest warrants were being issued for offences that were just not serious enough to warrant extradition. So that's the proportionality control. Now, it's really in respect of extradition where we feel the first hit of the loss of access to the Schengen information system. Um, previously, European arrest warrants were simply um, uploaded onto the Schengen information system and police officers in the street with their handheld computers were able to identify whether an individual was subject to an EAW and arrest on that basis. We can't do that anymore. We're now relying on Interpol channels and in the UK, the UK will not arrest on an Interpol red notice or diffusion notice alone. And that's one of the uh, issues that Estelle and I have been working on quite closely with our respective agencies, because you can see that could cause some operational issues. And then just whizzing through the rest, uh, mutual legal assistance. Well, as I say, that's one of the areas where there's top ups to uh, the Council of Europe Convention. That's the 1959 Convention in this case. Um, that's been one of the less problematic areas because European investigation orders, which re replaced international letters of request, only came in um, to operation relatively recently in 2017. So practitioners are broadly used to using uh, international letters of requests. And then the top ups um, provided for in the TCA include things such as time limits, which have been incredibly useful. There's also the possibility of direct transmission between France and the UK because of um, our having ratified the second additional protocol to the convention. So we're seeing really quite good cooperation in that area. Asset freezing and confiscation, a slightly more tricky area, but re a really important aspect of judicial cooperation in criminal matters, because this really means taking out dirty money from criminal networks. And that's really seen as the key, one of the key ways to try and permanently disrupt some of the most serious organised crime groups. So the provisions in the TCA, which are found in Title 11, so, um, are inspired by the Council of Europe Conventions of 1919-2005, um, to which not all member states participate in. And there's really a twofold regime. There's um, a mandatory regime which concerns uh, confiscation in criminal matters, and then a civil asset recovery regime, um, which is not mandatory and provides for cooperation to the extent possible under national law. But civil asset recovery is, can also be a very important tool for law enforcement um, partners. And then final point on operational information. I mentioned at the very start when I was describing my role that we had very different criminal justice systems, France and the UK. And one of those fundamental differences that many of you will be aware of is in France, um, investigations, criminal investigations are judicially led either by a prosecutor or by an investigating judge. That doesn't exist in the UK. It will be for independent autonomous law enforcement authorities to conduct an investigation. And then when they've gathered enough evidence, they will come to the relevant UK prosecution authority to ask them to make a charging decision. Now, what that can mean sometimes is what we want to do as the UK to cooperate with uh, France will want to do via police channels, so UK police speaking to French police, and the French can't do that because it's judicially led. So part of my job is to bridge that gap, but it also means what I might, what the French might want me to do on judicial channels, I can't because I don't have the judiciary in the UK involved yet. And operational information sharing is a way in which we can get information over to the French authorities without needing to use um, a specific judicial tool, such as a, an international letter of request. And previously, this is known as a spontaneous exchange of information. That was also an EU tool where we just send information to the French authorities and they could seamlessly incorporate it into their judicial procedure. We've lost that, but there are provisions in TACA, in the TCA, 
for um, exchanging information spontaneously where it relates to an ongoing investigation. And my colleague who works um, in organised immigration crime and uh, human trafficking is regularly using that provision where she's working closely with investigation teams in France. So that is an important point to note. And then finally, um, it was very important for the UK to try and maintain um, access and involvement in two key um, EU agencies, Europol and Eurojust. Um, I'm not going to go into any detail of those. You will know that there are already third party agreements in respect of other third countries. So the UK did have some precedent, um, but the um, UK essentially no longer has a seat at the table. It can't participate in any of the management boards, at either of those agencies, but it does have a seat in those offices and in fact um, the UK Eurojust desk which is um, a large desk it's a very busy office in Eurojust has been able to maintain its size so we've no longer um, got a UK national member we now have a liaison prosecutor as Estelle mentioned and she has a team of um, five assistants working with her but they're all prosecutors too so we're hoping we can continue our very close working relationship with partners at Eurojust and similarly at Europol and then um, just very briefly joint investigation teams which is a way in, in which law enforcement authorities and judicial authorities work together as a joint investigation team on some of the um, bigger, uh, wider scale cases, um, they are unaffected because um, even prior to the end of the transition period, the UK desk changed the legal basis to the Council of Europe Convention for all pending JITs. And now JITs will be agreed on this uh, Council of Europe Convention legal basis rather than EU legal basis. So we have seen um, real, really no change to um, operational cooperation on that basis. Um, now, I'm conscious that I think I've already been over um, 20 minutes, but I've put a little list at the end here of um, the EU capabilities that we no longer have access to, and probably the most important um, one being the Schengen Information System. Uh, Estelle already mentioned the prisoner transfer framework decision. We, we have an alternative, but the reality is that some of these alternatives are simply less good than the EU capability. And that is um, a consequence of the UK's um, decision. So I'm gonna stop there to give people um, time for questions. Uh, this has been uh, really extraordinarily useful. Um, I have followed during the four years that I was on the court after the referendum, I made a lot of speeches and mentioned many of these problems and questions and uh, predicted the worst. And it's really, really interesting to hear from two people in the front line how they have been trying to make the worst not happen. Uh, there's several questions coming. First one, I'm going to give Holly a rest and put the first one to Estelle. Yeah. Um, uh, and by the way, several people are saying, we really want to have those slides. It's, this is terribly valuable. And yeah. so both judges and practitioners have been sending points and questions. So question for Estelle, slowly, Clearly, simply, once <laughs> at a time, please. What is the best way to enforce a French civil judgment in England? <laughs> okay, um, the question is simple, but um, the answer is not. Because first, you have really to make sure what you intend by your civil cases, or your civil cases because by now you have to choose which one of the, the egg convention would apply. And if you go to a uh, um, purely civil decision, I would say, I don't know, uh, um, uh, uh, torts, maybe if we got a tort, so we got no contract, that's no criminal, that's no uh, commercial at all. Uh, by now, I would say that if you want to enforce the French one in the UK legal system, you have to go through an executive process because the UK, um, as far as I know, hasn't ratified yet the EA convention, the, the 30th of June uh, 
2005, uh, which uh, applied for recognition and implementation of civil decision. And again, that's why it's very important for UK to join the Lugano Convention to have the other option uh, to make it uh, um, uh, easier to have uh, um, direct and direct recognition uh, without going through uh, the executive process. And that's... I think that's what the process but it costs. You won't have the assurance uh, that your decision will be, um, will be enforced. So in this matter, it's quite clear. Um, for example, in some matters, we have, uh, if we talk about family matters, if we talk about uh, uh, divorce matters, for example, the UK have ratified the A Convention uh, from the 90s, but not France. So in these matters, we, ha we don't have a, a, a mutual um, convention uh, between our two countries. So you may ask the UK judiciary, uh, could you enforce my decision because you, UK, have been uh, your part of uh, this convention, but France is not part of this convention. So there are still some gaps. So first you have to make sure what field you are going through and to make my, my answer more difficult than I used to, and I should have started by, by this, I would ask another, another question. When was your decision made? Because if your decision has been made before the end of transition, and that was the beginning of my presentation, then the EU law still remains. So you can, all, you can still uh, apply Bruxelles, Bruxelles 1 or Bruxelles 2, but Bruxelles 1. But I think your question were more about if you got a French decision uh, done or may, I don't know, two, two, two days ago, what will happen to have this decision enforced in UK. So once again, it's when the decision has been made, has been made before the end of transition of after, so that the first question you have to, to, to raise first, and then uh, what are the fields, and you have any um, convention, any uh, uh, DA convention uh, enforceable and make sure that both country, France and the UK have as ratified. And to make more and more and more difficult, I give another exemption. If you go to the A convention, make sure that which nation has been ratified. For example, for uh, vulnerable people to enforce, for example, the decision of juge de tutelle, in France, Scotland has been ratified, but only Scotland. So if you go to a Scottish court, so you can ask for, but if you go um, to uh, a London court or a Northern Irish court, uh, those nations have been, hasn't been ratified for themselves. So it's, it's many questions have, you have to answer before. And so that's why I'm so sorry that I, ca I cannot send, I cannot tell a, a, a simple answer and, and, and I'd say that's so simple, that is not. And I think that's another question from Simon. What, what would be the, the most difficult? I think the most difficult um, would be uh, the recognition and enforcement of decision uh, uh, drafted after uh, uh, the period of, of transition. And uh, I think it, it, would be, it would be more difficult to have this, this decision enforced in our boss country. And we, ha we, we will have uh, less um, legal security that makes sure uh, that our decision will be, will be uh, enforced in our country. Okay, thank you. I don't know if I, 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 don't know if I was clear. <laughs> Well, you were not clear, but you were very accurate. And uh, that sadly is the state of affairs which we're going to have to live with. Um, now, you mentioned Simon's question. I want to put the same question to Holly Gallagher. Um, Simon Horsington, the founder of this association, uh, asks each of you, um, uh, how shall I say, what do you see as the biggest challenges, problems, uncertainties, uh, and let's divide the world into family, criminal, commercial. Um, we've heard uh, from Estelle 
uh, that she sees uh, enforcement cross-border entre guillemets cooperation as in civil matters as being more difficult. Holly, uh, what is your assessment of the um, the difficulties that we'll be facing um, under the new regime? Well, I mean, I, I totally agree with what Estelle has said in respect of enforcement, Ian, but um, I have to now give full disclosure and um, really um, civil commercial matters fall outside of the remit of my role in contrast to Estelle. So I don't have sort of direct practitioner experience of um, cooperation in, in those fields. So I don't feel sort of adequately enough placed to give a, a sort of um, a view on that. OK, fair enough. Um, let me, since we're talking to each other, let me put a question to you. You have said um, in your slides and orally that uh, one of the red lines of HMG was no role for my former uh, colleagues at the court, at the Court of Justice in Luxembourg. Um, you've been describing the making of rules to bind uh, the European Union and to bind, bind the UK. What, um, can you say a word please about the mechanisms established for resolving difficulties without involving the European Court? Yeah, so um, I, I didn't manage to get to that in the end, I'm afraid, in my presentation. Um, Some but... of us are fond of the court and uh, want to know how HMG has done it. Yeah, so uh, the agreement is to have a dispute resolution mechanism. So there are a number of specialised committees. So in respect of um, judicial cooperation in criminal matters um, and law enforcement cooperation, that is the specialised committee on law enforcement and um, judicial cooperation. And I think this is probably one of the fundamental differences um, between the uh, regime we've had as an EU member state and now um, our relationship with the EU under uh, the TCA. So um, disputes will first try, will try to resolve um, any issues via negotiation. So um, that's when the committee comes in and that's comprised of members from the EU and the UK who um, have relevant knowledge in that area. And um, it's co-chaired by a member of uh, the Commission and a representative of the UK government. And um, so there was really a sort of desire to get away from the idea of a European court, entre guillemets, um, to have something that felt, that looked and felt as though the UK um, was very much represented on it, although um, the CJU also being my former employer, um, I know full well that there was plenty of UK representation in that organisation. Um, but I think it's probably um, inevitable really that to keep a strict delineation um, between re the resolution reaching powers of this specialised committee and what's decided by the CJU is, is likely to be really difficult in practice because the, as I've mentioned, the TCA in a number of areas in this field uh, is very much reflective of the tools that we already had. So um, it's difficult to see how even in the event that the specialised um, committee is seized of trying to resolve particular disputes that have arisen in the context of the TCA, that the jurisprudence of the CJU does not have some influence on those decisions. And I think that would be a really interesting area yeah. um, to see develop in the future, because as Estelle has said, at the moment, we are in very, very, very early days. You know, her and I are very much focused on the nitty gritty sort of operational functioning of these um, new measures. Yes. I, yeah. I, 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 sorry, I think it's very important to, to understand that the special committees, it would be uh, at political level and it would be um, negotiation and try to, to uh, to, to, to have some, uh, some answers at political level, it won't be, I don't know, it won't be one uh, UK citizen or French citizen who, who can ask the committee and say, I, I don't agree about uh, the interpretation of this part of the TCA uh, in, in UK or how France, I don't know, does uh, implement one of these two in criminal matters. So I think it's, it's, it, it's completely different 
the way uh, how, how the committee will deal when we have uh, when we will have some disputes uh, regarding interpretation or regarding how we implement. Yes. But that's, that's completely different ways. Sure, I, I think um, just adding what I learned when I was on the court and subsequently, uh, there will be many many occasions when the European law, which has been relabeled, rebranded as English law or UK law or Scottish law, uh, there will be many occasions where the text drafted in Brussels with British participation does not have a clear answer. And it will be necessary for an English court to decide how to interpret those words. Now, there will be for sure occasions where the Court of Justice in Luxembourg has interpreted those words. And there's a sensitive political, legal, judicial question. The government doesn't want to uh, appear to re-accept the jurisprudence of the European Court. But on the other hand, uh, the judges will find it very difficult not to give attention and indeed respect um, to the decisions of the European Court. So that uh, issue in non-criminal matters about the meaning of, of um, European legislation, regulations and so on, it, those questions are going to come up a lot. Now, um, I am told by my betters that um, we need to bring this to an end because people have other appointments and they don't want to miss anything. Um, I'm really, I'm really sorry that we um, have to end because there's dozens of important questions which uh, have been raised by the presentations of our two guests this morning. Um, we're really very, very grateful you will, those who are watching will get copies of Estelle's slides, sorry about the technical glitch, and you'll also get Holly's for um, convenience. And uh, I think that we should agree that these two uh, ladies should be invited back uh, later in the year to explain um, how the UK and the European Union and France have coped with the unsettled, painfully unsettled questions which have been identified. It's extremely interesting for me to hear a detailed analysis of how people on both sides, pour ainsi dire, uh, have been trying to tidy up the mess, um, re uh, the regulatory mess or swamp uh, created by the uncertainties after Brexit. Um, so, sorry to cut it short. Oops, there's another question here. Uh, oops. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry. Um, no. Nope. Uh, this ah, It's just a compliment. Someone is saying your slides were great. So we all knew that, and I don't need to ask you the question. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. Thanks to Leonardo for having set this up.